It gladdens my heart that I've been asked to share my thoughts with you on a subject that has remained evergreen throughout the ages, the subject of leadership. Throughout the ages, men have asked, how do we lead ourselves into what we desire? Throughout the ages, men and women have sought to improve their circumstances through leaders. Throughout the ages, leaders of one kind or another have emerged. Throughout the ages, the subject of leadership has been interrogated. And it doesn't matter which civilization one is talking about, leadership is at the very heart of the affairs of man. If you look at any of the holy books, the question of leadership is one that is at the very heart of it. Those of you who are assembled here who are Christians will remember the many times that the question of leadership has come to the fore. Many of you have read the story of great leaders in the Bible, such as Abraham, such as Moses, such as David, and many others. Those of you who are familiar with other civilizations will also recognize that leadership has preoccupied the minds of men. Indeed, within the continent of Africa, despite the difficulties that we have had to go through, leadership has always been at the back of our mind. And one can go into history. One can go into the history of Africa before she was colonized. And one will remember whether you are talking about the Zulu of South Africa, or you are talking about the Ovambo and the Ovimbundu of Angola, or the Akan of Ghana, or the Yoruba of Nigeria, that the question of leadership has remained alive and well. Even when other civilization cross seas and oceans to come to this continent, and they enslaved us, there were leaders who rose. They may have been overwhelmed, our kith and kin may have been taken from the shores of the continent of Africa into other parts of the world, but we never stop leading. And when slavery lost its luster and other civilizations once again sat in Berlin in 1884 and 1885 and divided our continent into what we now call the 55 countries of Africa, our leaders were never, ever lost. The leaders were there, and they were clear in their mind that one day we would regain our independence. And I remember so very vividly that even as those other civilizations abused and denigrated the African peoples, Africans never slept through the revolution. They were alive and well and clear that the freedom that had been taken away from them would be regained. I remember so very vividly, courtesy of history, when Africans in the far, in the far lands in the Caribbean were thinking about how they would come back to the mother continent to regain their dignity. I can remember the works of great Africans such as Marcus Garvey, I can remember. I can remember the great works of Africans such as Williams, I can remember. I can remember the great works of your own South African Pixley Kaisa Kaseme as early as 1906 saying, we shall regenerate Africa, I can remember. I can remember, I can remember the voices of great Africans in those early days. I can still hear, even as I stand here, 
the great words of Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah say, we shall write our own history. I can remember the words of Patrice Emery Lumumba saying, we shall regain our independence. I can remember the conviction of Nelson Holisa Mandela. I can remember the words of Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe reminding us that there is no, only one race, the human race. I can remember. And when I remember that, I remember throughout the ages that what has distinguished humanity is the question of leadership. Leaders who rise up, leaders who come up and sacrifice all and say to themselves that we shall indeed rise to ensure that our circumstances will change. You know, when we talk about leadership today, we must ask ourselves certain fundamental questions. Who is a leader because we live in a world today where there are men and women who by dint of occupation of public office think that they are leaders. But many of them are not. Many of them are misleaders. And there is no shortage of such men and women both in this continent, in this country and the rest of the world. And it is incumbent upon us to realize that when our circumstances have been captured by men and women who are merely pretending to be leaders, then we will never realize what we desire. And what we desire is that justice must be done for all. What we desire is that the promises that have been made to us throughout the ages must be fulfilled. What we desire is that our dignity as human beings must never be undermined. What we desire is that we must give meaning to the words of the carpenter of Nazareth, that we are not children of a lesser God. What we must desire is the recognition, and this has been recognized throughout the ages, that we must be our brother's keeper. What we must desire is to ensure that we live in a world where we are judged not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. That is what we desire. And we are gathered here today, therefore, to remind ourselves that throughout the ages, men and women have always realized their potential when there was clarity in their mind. We cannot afford to be of two minds. You who read the Bible will remember certain iconic moments in the Bible when the leaders are called upon to lead and the led are called upon to provide leadership in their own way. When you go out today, I want you to remember the story of that man called Elijah. You remember him saying to the prophets of Baal, and telling them the time has come that we must choose in order to move in the right direction. And he calls all of them and he says, let us not be of two opinions. If God is God, worship God. And if Baal is Baal, is God, worship Baal. I am today telling you that when you want to be a leader, you must be able to recognize what direction you are going to face. You cannot afford to be of two minds. I can also remember... In the book of the prophet Joshua, which you are aware of, Joshua assembling all the hosts of Israel and asking them, choose you now whom you shall serve, whether you shall serve the Lord, the gods of our ancestors before we cross the river, or you shall serve the gods of the Amorites in whose land we sojourn, or you shall serve the Lord as for me and my house, we have chosen to serve the Lord. Today I'm telling you that we must make choices. We must make choices and make the right choices. And you know, when I listen to the reverend talking about those who ask him whether there is a distinction between being a pastor and being a person who is looking at the affairs of man, there is no distinction between church and politics. Church and politics are Siamese twins. Because the last time I checked, the divine instruction is that we must eat. And eating is a political issue. The last time I checked, 
I discover that we must have water and water is a political and a spiritual issue. The last time I checked, we must go to the toilet and that is a political issue and indeed also a biblical issue. The last time I checked, there is nothing that is in the Bible which is not a political question. It is therefore the duty of a pastor to be as political as politics can be. Because before we go to heaven, we must eat. Before we go to heaven, we, when we are sick, we must go to hospital. We must do that. So today, I'm, I'm, I'm here before you to remind every pastor, wherever they are, every man of God, that one of your greatest vocations is to be a politician. The question is, what kind of a politician? That is the only question. What kind of a politician? What kind of politics? Because there is politics and politics. And the politics that we are talking about is the politics that will liberate our countries and will liberate our minds. When I remember the history of this country, I can still remember during the dark days of apartheid, I remember the voice of Desmond Pilo Tutu bellowing from the pulpits and telling the architects of apartheid that we cannot delude ourselves by pretending that we are singing hallelujah while our kith and kin are being judged on the basis of the color of their skin. We must sing hallelujah in the recognition that our duty is to be our brother and sister's keeper. Was Desmond Pilo too to a man of God and a politician? He was both and he had to be both. I can still remember the voice of Alan Busak beaming from the pulpit and saying, Behold, we must fight the injustices. And I can still go and remember the voice of Christ himself telling those who are standing in the way of fairness and justice that it is incumbent upon us to be politicians. So today I'm inviting all of us to be politicians. I'm inviting all of us to be politicians because it is only when we are politicians who believe in certain virtues that we can liberate our countries. Because history has demonstrated not once, not twice, but times without number that when we abandon our political duties, when we are not devoted citizens, there is no shortage of men and women whose only desire is to devour us. It is our duty to stand in their way. It is our duty to deny them the oxygen that they need to survive. It is our duty to tell them unequivocally that we shall not allow you to run roughshod over us. It is our duty to remind them that you cannot normalize the absurd. It is our duty to remind them that they cannot be greedy to our detriment. It is our duty to remind them that we cannot allow ourselves to be led by men and women whose only claim to fame is that they are greedy beyond measure. It is our duty to remind them that we have a duty to make this world a good world for everybody else. It is our duty to remind them that whenever we have fought slavery, whenever we have fought colonization, whenever we fight neocolonization, whenever we have fought apartheid, we wanted our lives to be lived in a manner that was dignified. We must remind them. So today, we are here to remind ourselves that we must be leaders of ourselves. Because we have learned over the years that is only when you lead yourself, when you cleanse yourself, that you can be a good leader. You know, sometimes, and many are those times, when I read the story in the Bible, and I read about Jesus of Nazareth, and I wrap my mind about his humility, and I hear him many times saying that he did not come to be served, but he came to serve. Yes. Then I look at our leaders who, when they are seeking to serve us, and it's not only in South Africa, 
It is almost everywhere in the Bible. When they are seeking our support, they are humility personified. They kiss babies. <laughs> they go to the shebin. They drink from dirty cups. They walk on food. They smile with us. They take photos with everybody. They discard their security. They are humility personified. They speak the language that we want to hear. They do the thing that they think we want to see them do. They delude us. They cheat us. And somehow we accept that they are leaders. But immediately they get what they want. Oh, they have a reverse Pauline conversion. If they were Paul, they go back to being souls. And we can no longer recognize them. When you ring them, their phones are picked by somebody called a PA, whose only claim to fame that he is rude beyond measure. When you go to the officers, when you go to the officers, they no longer want to see you. When they are driving in the streets, their sirens scare you. While I suspect that those who discovered the siren meant that it should be used for good purposes. For them it is a badge of honor and they harass us in the streets. They acquire things which they have not worked for. They want to be described as honorable even when they are horrible. These are the men that we have. And there is no shortage of such men and women in the African continent. They promise us things that they know they will never deliver. And we believe them. I am today telling us that a devoted citizen must have eyes that can see such individuals. Because who is a devoted citizen? A devoted citizen is a citizen who is aware of his or her circumstances. A devoted citizen is a citizen who is going to sacrifice for the sake of this generation and generations yet to be born. This country has had devoted citizens. Nelson Mandela was such a devoted citizen. Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe was such a devoted citizen. Chris Hani was such a devoted citizen. And I know that there are many others who are devoted, devoted citizens. Winnie Madikezela Mandela was such a devoted citizen. <laughs> Albertina Sisulu was such a devoted citizen. And many Tirongoposte was such a devoted citizen. There has been no shortage of devoted citizens in this country, both known and unknown. And that is why this country is iconic. I remember when I talk about devoted citizens when I was a young graduate, when I was a young high school student, even when I was a primary school student, I remember history teaching me about the Sharpville massacre when men and women came out and they feared nothing and they were prepared to die and some of them died that you may leave. I remember in 1976, young primary school children dying that you may leave. I remember many great South Africans spending their time in jail, suffering that you may leave. The question now, are you devoted citizens? Or you have become champagne revolutionaries, <laughs> whose only claim to fame is that you want to eat bacon in the morning, and to have, have caviar at lunchtime, and to have lamb chops in the evening, and punctuate it with wine, and then you say, behold, I'm a revolutionary. That is not revolution. Revolution is about recognizing what must be done, and that it must be done with devotion, and it must be done consistently, and it must be done in a manner that is going to save the continent of Africa. That is what we are talking about. That is how I understand it. And I, I am of the view that this country and this continent must do it. 
Today, many times when I think about my continent, this continent of Africa, this mother continent, this continent that is the cradle of human civilization, this continent that has known abuse by the slavers, this continent that has been colonized, this continent that has known neocolonization, this continent that has known apartheid, this continent that is the home of all minerals known to man, this continent that is the home of rivers that produce waters, this continent that has over 1.4 billion, this continent which is great in prospect, but this continent which is at the lower rungs of the ladder, this continent I think of her, where are our leaders? How can it be that in the 1940s we fought that we may drive out the colonizer and the colonizer is coming back again? How can it be? How can it be that 60 years ago we regained our independence and our young men and women are now fighting to go to the land of the colonizers? How can it be? How can it be that 28 years ago you slew the giant that was appetite, but there is still appetite of an economic kind? How can it be? How can it be? And how can it be that we are comfortable in that environment? How can it be? It cannot be right. How can we claim that we are devoted citizens when those realities confront us on a daily basis? How can it be? I hear cries across the continent of Africa. I hear cries from that kind Senegal. They are asking, how can it be? that we cannot feed ourselves, they're asking in Dhaka. They're asking in the Gambia, how can it be? The same question is asked in Sierra Leone, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Benin, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Sudan, in South Sudan, in Somalia, in Mozambique, in Botswana, in Lesotho, in Eswatini, in South Africa. They're asking, how can it be? How can it be that every other civilization comes to our continent and takes away that which they desire and leave us in deprivation, they ask. They are asking, how can the world order be of such a nature that the French can come here and do what they will and go away without consequence? They are asking, how can the British come here and do what they will and leave without consequence. They are asking, how is it that the Americans can come here and do what they will and leave without consequence? They are asking, how can the Turks come here? How can the Arabs come here? Do what they will and leave without consequence. Are they asking, why? How can the Chinese come here? And they do what they will and leave without consequence. Are they are asking, how is it that the world order is arranged? that when we of the African continent appear in world bodies, whether it's the WHO, we have no vaccines when we are sick. When we appear at the United Nations, we can vote all we want, but a single European country can veto all our votes and neutralize us, giving meaning to the unfortunate situation that we are indeed lesser human beings. How can it be? that when they meet a G7 and decide for us, we are not there unless we are invited for a photo opportunity. When they meet a G20, we are not there unless we are invited for a photo opportunity. How can it be? How can it be? Where are our leaders, we ask? How can it be? Where are our leaders in all these? What are they doing about it? What are we doing about it? What must we do about it? Why is it that we have leaders and we cannot feed ourselves because there is a war in Ukraine? 
How can it be? How can it be that when we have COVID, the claim to fame of our political leaders is that they become multi-millionaires and we don't have vaccines? How can it be? How can it be that we have hostels and all equipment is imported from other civilizations? How can it be? How can it be that we have schools in which we have no faith? How can it be that even our airlines fly aeroplanes that are made by other civilizations? And we cannot even hello everyone i hope you're all doing fine now i want to take this chance to first thank you for having taken your time to listen to this video and having taken your time to actually understand whatever pilolo mumba is saying now if you've never heard or if you have no idea of who pilolo mumba is now let me just give you a summary of this guy he is one of the great philosophers, one of the greatest men I adore in Africa. Now, Pilo Lumumba is a Kenyan professor who has always spoken truth to power. He has always been on the nerves of the greedy, corrupt leaders we have in Africa. He has always talked about greediness and corruption, looting of public resources in black countries, all uh, all over the world now this speech really took me and i'm here talking to you because this is whatever we need at the moment now we've been elected we've been electing some village force i do not f double o l s to lead us these people have always taken us for for a ride because they know at the long run they'll come with the money then corrupt some of us corrupt those um, uh, voters then they'll be voted back now have you ever asked yourself why will someone use three million dollars to campaign then we know the salary which he or she is going to get for those years he will be on in power is that is less than two million dollars why will someone use 30 million dollars 50 million dollars to campaign for a job that won't even pay him 20 million dollars uh, after all those years why are they so much interested in clinching these seats in getting into power now we all know that these people do not even depend on the salaries these salaries are whatever they give during fundraising they depend on whatever they are going to loot that's why they are so much obsessed they can do anything even they can go ahead and take lives because of being elected to these political seats now i've been listening to pilo lumumba and i think this man needs support from uh, leaders like ibrahim traore now this person called Pilo Lumumba this professor has always spoken so much sense I do not want we take him for granted because this is a man who has seen where we are going to this is a man who has watched evil uh, take over our societies this is the man to watch and how I would like how one day I will really love to see such people like Pilo Lumumba being sponsored by the people to power then we see if whatever he says he can actualize the words into actions I've watched him talk about Coca-Cola I've watched him talk about talk about IMF I've watched him talk about World Bank and how they've always uh, always come around to haunt uh, Africa to haunt black countries including the Caribbean so that they can get their resources so that they can blackmail them use deceit and 
bad financial policies like the ones the IMF is pushing on Africans and the Caribbean, uh, the high taxing policies so that they can see our countries run bankrupt and the people turn against their government. Now, in Africa is where we've elected some people who are villagers who have always come with narratives that create uh, maybe uh, disunity among us. The narrative of um, poverty, rich and all that. Let me today tell you, in this world we, have, we only have two classes of people. We don't have black and white. We have poverty, poor and rich. Now, black and white was a narrative that was driven by capitalism and socialism so that the people can be divided and leave alone the problems that the real problems that are facing them politically, socially and economically and focus on those things that will always divide them. Now, let's assume this. The narrative of racism was being driven now both politically so socially and economically and do you know why it's because when people are united when people speak one language imagine if the caribbean could be speaking one language jamaica speaking with with one language as a uh, uh, haiti with one language as saint lucia with one language as the dominican republic with one language as those any other St. Kitts and all those other countries including Cuba and all those ones. Now imagine yourself speaking one language. IMF, World Bank could have never had the opportunity uh, to brainwash the leaders in these places because the people could be watching, the people could be the real watchdog of their countries. But since they created boundaries they created division they created uh, 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 socialism they created capitalism they created all these things just to disunite the people just to have the people uh, divided so that they could be much easier to rule and bring bad financial policies and economic policies to this country. Now we've seen IMF conquer and terrorize Africa to a point where the people are getting out to protest against their own leaders so that they can be freed from bad financial and bad taxation policies. Now, what is that one thing they want to do with us? What's one thing that we've always gone against? Now, we've seen so many bad leaders, corrupt leaders being elected and re-elected. How stupid can we be to be electing the same bad people into power why can't we just open our eyes let's listen to whatever these people have been doing let's actually see with our own eyes let's speak truth to power we've always voted the wrong people now we vote the worst people to lead us we elect dictators to lead us a dictator will never dictate will never actually lead these people will actually rule over you and you know when they rule over you you are done whatever they say whatever their desires are are passed into laws imagine a country where you can't speak your own mind now come to africa africa has so many dictators but you won't be told that you will be told these people want the best for their country they are actually dictators dictators plus puppets plus thieves plus corrupt leaders those are some of individuals that are leading us some of those people even never went to school now i'm not speaking of school to be uh, a direct ticket to leadership but i'm speaking uh, about these things about school because we need people who are civilized people who know how much this uh, countries uh, have cost us the western countries have cost our countries and its economy now talking of economy go to the caribbean come to africa see how much our economy are deteriorating now some of the people will still defend the same leaders who are putting bad leadership who are coming up with vague uh, 
I'm just even tired of speaking about the same thing. How much are we going to see this? How much should we talk so that our people should be enlightened? Now, we've talked these things now and again. But we have some people who are so much brainwashed. And they go even far as uh, now defending the same rotten leaders who are taxing us badly. Using our money for for actually for their own benefit the public resources that should have been used to build cancer hospitals uh, uh, for chemo for chemos to be done to those cancer patients hospitals that could have actually helped our people it's so bad to speak about this it's so bad it is time we speak truth to power race let's rise up and realize our continent and our black people are heading to the wrong direction it is time it is time it is time let's speak truth to power thank you so much for having taken your time to watch this video one love